Hey friends, Nike Spalding here. I'm excited to do this. I, and for some of you guys, it's like a recap. And for some of you, it's new material. But we are going to try this experiment where we're going to do tap in person every Tuesday night from 7 to 8.30. And then we'll do this, what I'm going to call, I guess, a recap, a pared down version of it. Uh, and hopefully for those who can't make it, or maybe if you just want to hear it again, this will be a good resource for y'all. But so this week we're starting our brothers and sisters class on tap. And really what this is all about is we want to look at what does it mean for men and women to partner together in the church and in the culture at large. And we recognize that at St. Jude, we're in the minority camp by having a woman do the things that I do, a woman that teaches and preaches on Sunday morning as well as does the sacraments. And so 93% of churches in the world do not have women do that. So we recognize we're in the 7% minority. But if you think about the world, the world is predominantly Roman Catholic or Orthodox churches. So if we just like hacked them out of there, then the numbers get a little bit more in favor of the direction that we're going. But we recognize that we are in the odd group. Uh, but what we think we're doing is not odd at all. We think it's very faithful. And so we're going to build up to what we call the problematic text, the text that I'm sure you guys have heard throughout your life about the role of women in the church or what women can and can't do. But I think the best way to have that conversation is to start in the beginning, which is what we're going to do today. We're going to look at the creation ideals for women and men together. Then we're going to look at what it looks like in the scriptures, both positive and negative examples. Uh, we're going to look, of course, how Jesus treats women and what we can learn from the scriptures. And then we'll build up to uh, looking at those problematic texts because I don't think they're actually problematic at all. But I think it helps to have the full counsel of scripture in these conversations. And so, um, yeah, so that's where we're headed. So as you all know, the goal of all Christian instruction is ultimately worship. So if you're listening to this at home, push pause. Stop listening to me for a second and take a moment and ask yourself, what's your favorite part of creation that reminds you of the creator? And if you're watching this with a friend or you're doing this in a small group, you guys can discuss this together as a group. And so we're going to be talking about the creation ideal today. What did God create in the garden? And so take some time. Think about your favorite part of creation. On Tuesday, we heard things like food. Uh, we heard things like language that God created so many languages. We heard, um, I think that's all I remember. But anyways, take a moment, hit pause, and then we'll jump in. All right, welcome back. So like I said, this week is creation ideals. And so what we're going to be asking and answering is, what did God create in the garden, right? In the beginning, God creates the heavens and the earth. And we know we get to this part about humanity. And so we're going to look at that part of the text. And then we're going to ask ourselves, can we live like that now? Should we live like that now? Where are we going? So we're going to be looking at all three gardens, the Garden of Eden, the Garden of, well, it's not really, it's Gethsemane-ish. And then, of course, the final garden that we're heading to in Revelation. So back to this question, what did God make? If I were to ask you, what have you heard about the creation account? Like when you've heard this taught before, what themes, what phrases, what has come up before in the past? For some people, Genesis 1 and 2 is the text that they go to for marriage, which makes sense. It talks about man and woman coming together, becoming one flesh and, and, and loving each other and leaving their parents. Uh, some people said they've heard dominion, rulership, uh, that we're supposed to cultivate, that we're supposed to rule and reign. And then hopefully what you've heard about men and women is that both men and women were made in the image of God. But this question of purpose, right? If, if God is designing something, he's creating, we have to assume there's like a reason. There's this tell us behind it. And we do believe that the reason why God's created male and female in his image is for us to be partners with him and his mission in the earth. That God would create us to be his icons, his image bearers, and that we would go out into the world and we would do the things that God wants to accomplish in the world as part of his mission. The question, how are they to relate? That's what we're going to answer today as we jump into the text. And so hit pause, read Genesis 1, 26 through 28, and then Genesis 2, 15 through 25. I want you to just hit pause and read those so you can understand what we're talking about. And depending on the translation you read, you may see that uh, I might be messing with some of your categories by the end of this lesson. So but go ahead and hit pause, read that, and we'll jump in. Okay, the first thing I want to point out about this creation account is one of the things that has happened when we talk about man and woman is that when I ask you the question, how are they to relate? One of the things that you might have heard taught many times, or maybe you still believe, and that's okay if you do, but I'm going to try and push against this a little bit, is this idea of hierarchy. We have been taught at many times that there's a hierarchy in the creation account. There's God, there's man, there's woman. And so some people have heard this and they've heard this taught. And this idea of hierarchy, 
I believe comes up because of something called the Septuagint. So in about 283, 246 BC, we have the original Bible that the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. That was the language of the people, the lingua franca as we call it, and so we have the Hebrew text. But over time, the people of God who are living in and around Israel, that part gets overtaken by the Greeks and then the Romans. So the Greeks come in and take it over at about this time. So they decide to translate the Hebrew Old Testament into Greek, which makes a ton of sense because that's the language that the people are speaking. And so what happens, I'm going to explain to you what happens. This guy, William Loder, you, you can read this whole quote if you want. I can send you the links. Oh, well, I'll pick that back up. Uh, but I'm going to explain to you what happens here. What happens in the Hebrew, and hopefully you guys can see this, and so I'll hold this out. In the Hebrew text, there's this really fun play on words. So what, what we believe is going on in creation is God creates the world and everything in it. Okay, he creates the heavens and the earth, and then he fills it. And so what you see is this kind of threefold building containers and then filling the containers. So he separates the earth from the sky, and then he puts lights in the sky and all that. He separates the waters from the earth, and then he puts animals in those things. So he builds the domain, the arena, so to speak, and then he fills that arena. And then God's like, it's good, it's good, it's good. Everything's good. We're building up in this goodness thing. It's a really cool thing. And it's poetry. It's Hebrew poetry. God is like beatboxing back in the old days, giving the scriptures to the people of Israel. And then we get into chapter, the end of chapter 1. He says, let us, plural, Trinitarian God, make mankind in our image. And even that mankind word, it starts with man. I prefer the word humanity because that's really what the word is meaning in that context. Let us make humans in our image. And then chapter 2 opens up, and that camera narrows in even more on those humans. And in the Hebrew, what's really fun in that poetry is there's this play on words. So I'm going to show you what's happening. Out of the earth, okay, so we have this creation crescendo that's building towards humanity. God's creating the earth. He's filling the earth. It's tov. It's good. It's good. And the crescendo is getting louder and louder as he gets to building humans. And in the Hebrew, out of the earth, which is the Hebrew word adama, he makes earthlings, adam. Okay, and so it's a fun play on Hebrew words. In other words, the source of humans is from the ground. So out of the ground, he makes groundlings, or out of the earth, he makes earthlings, of which there are two kind. So Adam can be translated as just humanity. It doesn't have to be male. It doesn't have to mean man. Then out of that man, that humanity there, there are two kinds, Ish and Isha. Ish meaning man or husband, and Isha meaning woman or wife. So what we have in the Hebrew is this unbelievable amount of poetry where these things are supposed to partner together. Mankind, humanity, comes out of the ground. The earthlings come out of the earth, and they're meant to partner together. Humanity is supposed to rule and reign over the ground and till it, but then the ground gives us back good things, and they're supposed to be this symbiotic relationship where certainly humanity is ruling over it, but there's this like goodness out of the source of which you come. From dust you came, from dust you'll return. So out of that ground, God makes a groundling, an Adam, and out of that Adam, there are two kinds, an Ish and an Isha. It's really beautiful. It's an incredibly beautiful play on words. Well, when it gets translated over into the Greek, the Greek does not have this play on words equivalent. So what started as like from the ground up, like this crescendo that builds up to these two humans, Adam and Eve, ruling and reigning together, dominion made in the image of God, when we get to the Greek, it kind of flips the whole thing. Because now you no longer have a dom for the ground, or excuse me, a dama. You have this word eretz. And out of the eretz comes the man, the, the aner, and out of the aner comes the gune. So all of a sudden, when we switch over to the Greek, we don't have this like symbiotic language thing that's happening, and instead we have a completely different way of understanding it. So what happens, and if you've been reading the William Loder quote over my, sh my shoulder, you already know where I'm going with this. What happens when we translate it into the Greek is we end up with hierarchy. And we see this in so many of the writings, especially in a time period right before Jesus, a couple hundred years before Jesus. The, the scholars, the Jewish scholars of the day, they're looking at the creation account, but they're looking at it in Greek. And they're saying, hey, here's God, then man, and then woman. And what they conclude incorrectly is that man, male, is made in the image of God, and female is made in the image of man. And that creates problems. Because if one of you is made in the image of God, and the other one of you is made in the image of the human, there is hierarchy. And there's a diminishing of value. 
you, you're going to tell half the world women that they're not made in the image of God, that's going to have an effect on how you treat them. They are not going to be as important as men who are made in the image of God. Okay, and so this is what happens when we get this translation. So suddenly hierarchy enters in these conversations where I believe back in the original Hebrew, it's this really beautiful poetry, this idea that they're supposed to come together and partner together. So in other words, God makes mankind, humanity, a dom in his image, and that better word than to describe that would be humanity. And it encompasses both male and female in that. And so there's no hierarchy, and then the Greek translation comes up and kind of messes things up. So you might have heard, though, that the hierarchy is in this text, and people go, well, what if there is no hierarchy in the Hebrew? And people go, no, there is a hierarchy, because one argument people make is source. This idea of what you came out of has rulership over you. And they use this as an example, like Eve was made out of Adam, therefore Adam came first. He's her source, and so he's more important than her. But to which we would say, no, 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 no. In the Hebrew, the ground is the source of humanity. And we don't think the ground is more important than humanity. And so this idea of source gets really confusing when you go back to the Hebrew because it's very clearly the earthlings come out of the source earth and the isha comes out of the source ish. And really what we see there is complementarity, not the source argument. And the second thing is they talk about, well, the order of creation. Well, someone was created first therefore they're more important, to which we'd say, I don't know, because animals were created first, then humanity. Like, there doesn't seem to be a priority. Instead, if anything, there's a crescendo building up, not the other way around. It gets more important the farther up the ladder it goes, which I am not saying that women are more important because they're last. What I'm trying to say is the jewel of all creation is humanity, is what I believe Hebrews 1 and 2, or the Hebrew translation of Genesis 1 and 2 is trying to teach us that there's a crescendo, and the top of it is Adam, humanity, of which there are two kinds, Ish and Isha, male and female, in which they are meant together to image God and to rule and reign and have dominion over the land. So this question, though, what did God make? If I haven't convinced you yet, maybe this will convince you more of what God intended to make when it comes to women. God goes to them and he says, hey, Adam, Adam, I have made you without a counterpart. And uh, this isn't good. And they look at all the animals and they're like, hey, I mean, German shepherds are dope, not really a companion like you. Elephants, super sweet, cool, not really a companion like you. So God says to him, I'm going to make you an azer. So if you go back and you look at Genesis 2, it says in there, I'm going to make for you, most of your translations are going to say something like this. The KJV says, a help me. The NIV says, I'm going to make a helper suitable for Adam. Um, the ESV says, helper fit for him. The message says, helper companion. It actually says, like, the message is kind of, it's, like, really expansive. You should go read it sometime. The CSB, my preferred translation, says, a helper corresponding to him. And that's my favorite translation. I still don't think helper is the right word. The net says, a companion. Ah, we changed it up. For him that corresponds to him. So you're going, okay, helper, right? Part of the reason why we think that there's maybe a hierarchy in the creation order is because God creates men and then he creates a helper for men. And you go, well, that's a pretty good translation. Everybody here just agrees with it, right? It's, it's what the word means. Kind of. The problem with the translation A's are there. The problem isn't that it doesn't mean helper. It absolutely means helper. But the problem is in our English language, helper usually connotates an insubordinate role. Okay, it, it, it usually connotates like a role underneath. So like you're like, hey, I'm the boss and this is my helper. Now, it doesn't mean they're not valuable to you. It doesn't mean that they're not somebody that you cherish. And it doesn't mean that you're, you don't want them with you. But that's not equal typically. I'm so-and-so and this is my helper. And the problem with it is that word azer. If you're talking, so you got to remember, who is it that God is writing to? Who is it that God is saying, hey, Genesis 1 and 2, this is for you? Well, if you remember, Moses has rescued the people out of Egypt, okay? They've been enslaved for 400 years. They are an impoverished, malnourished people group, and they're asking the question, who is Yahweh and who are we? And that's really the questions that Genesis 1 and 2 is asking and answering. We're not, you know, Jewish scholars don't ask the question, was the world created in seven days? We think Genesis 1 and 2 is answering that. Like, there's a literalness that modern scholars place upon the Bible that we'd go, that's not the point of Hebrew poetry. Like Genesis 1 and 2 isn't asking and answering where did dinosaurs come from. 
What it's asking and answering is, who is God and who are we? And the answer to that is God is not like Egypt, where there's many different gods. And God is not like Egyptians where y'all fought and then the earth was created out of a war. No, God existed and he breathed and created the world. And humans, most of the time in the ancient world, humans were created to be slaves to the God, to serve the God. And God goes, no, 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 I created you to have rulership and dominion and to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And so this asking and answering is answering questions that an enslaved people really need to know. Who is God and who are we? So he's telling these men and women who've come out of slavery, 400 years of slavery, this is who you are. You are made in the image of Yahweh. You are meant to rule and reign. And by the way, men, I have given you an azer in the women around you. You go, azer, okay, how would that group of people have understood that word azer? Well, the way they would have understood it is they probably would be thinking to battle language. And the reason why is because this word azer is used over a hundred times in scripture often in the context of battle. It is often used in the context of someone providing a help for you that you desperately need. And so I've listed some of the passages here that you can go look and it's talking about like here, God's gonna help us conquer the land. And here it's talking about we need a helper to deliver us from this problem. And Psalm 121, one through two, my favorite one in all this, it says, we look to the hills, where does our help, our azer come from? Our azer, our help comes from the Lord. They need rescuing. So this idea of Azer is not just some helper. It's not someone that's in the kitchen. Like, it's not June Cleaver. It's Gal Gadot Wonder Woman. That's the imagery here that the people would have been hearkened back to. And so we see this word Azer used in these passages of strong helper, strong companion. Like, strength is the idea in this word, not subordination, strength. And so all the net, the bastions of liberal theology, I'm just kidding, they're very conservative. The net was created by Dallas Theological Seminary, in case y'all didn't know. And Dallas Theological Seminary is a very conservative, complementarian school. Okay, so th these are complementarians saying this, not egalitarians, complementarians saying that the English word helper isn't such a great word because it can connote so many different ideas and it does not quite capture azer. Usage of the Hebrew term does not suggest a subordinate role at all, like, it, like at all. And in fact, a helper can have. And so in the Bible, God is frequently described as the helper, the one who does for us what we cannot do for ourselves. The one who does for us what we cannot do for ourselves, the one who meets our needs. And in this context, the word seems to express the idea of an indispensable companion. Sorry, guys. I love that. An indispensable companion. This idea, God makes a dom, humanity, out of which there's two kinds, ish and isha. And he looks at the ish and he goes, ah, there's nothing for you here in the created account so far. So I'm going to put you to sleep in your bone of your bone and the flesh of your flesh. And I'm going to create for you an isha. And she's going to be an indispensable companion. In other words, she's going to do for you what you can't do for yourself. The idea is that the woman supply what the man was lacking in design of creation and logically it would follow that the man would of course supply what was lacking from her it's not stated but that's the assumption like the idea is not the crescendo of creation goes man then woman the idea is creation goes to humanity of which we need each other if anything i think the problem with the word complementarianism is that this actually teaches complementary the idea that we complement each other that the only way a person can adequately reflect the trinitarian god is if there's more than one, because Trinity is distinction, unity, equality, but it's also three persons, one essence, three persons, one essence, and God is saying, we're gonna create a humanity in our image, and we're gonna make it to where they need each other. It's in a beautiful thing. Like, I know in our modern sensibilities, we're always like, oh, we don't wanna need anything, we wanna be independent, then like, I wanna pick up myself with my bootstraps, like, I'm a woman, hear me roar, I am man, I need nothing, and that is not Christian. <laughs> it's just not. We need each other, and it's a beautiful and good thing. And if you've had good relationships with your brothers and your sisters, you see this, and you go, this is a good thing. And so what did God make in the garden? I believe that he made a humanity in his image, not just men, not just men. Men and women are made in his image. They are incomplete without partnering with each other. We need each other, which is a good thing. 
and dare I say, what he created in the garden is brothers and sisters. Now, is marriage in the context of the garden? Yes. That is absolutely what's happening here. Most Jewish scholars would say that is the only thing happening here is a marriage context. And often Genesis 1 and 2 was a polemic in the ancient world right before Jesus against any sort of activity that wasn't, that was contrarian to Jewish cultural sexual values. So this is an idea like, hey, who you have sex with is who you are like connecting to. So the idea of rampant sexual activity outside the context of marriage, this is where the Jews would point to this and go, no, 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 this is God's design for sex. And so it was predominantly, yes, a polemic against any sort of sexual activity that the Jews would deem abhorrent, that most of us would agree is and was abhorrent going on in the culture. But many scholars today are going, no, 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 this is also about what it means for men and women to belong to each other, to need each other, to be dependent on each other. So it's really beautiful. So one of the things that I believe is I believe all truth is ultimately God's truth, if it's true. And if it's God's truth, then we should see social science is backing this up. I don't think God makes up rules that don't bring about our flourishing. I believe that when God creates something, he says, this, is, this will bring good for you, that the heart behind it is to bring about our flourishing. So I love it when the social sciences point out what we already know. So it doesn't matter if you're reading Harvard Business Review, McKinsey, TED Talks, whatever. If you are trying to figure out how companies can be successful, do you know what they learn over and over and over and over again? Mixed gender at the top, multi-ethnic, multi-socioeconomic class background, diversity at the top, especially among the genders, brings about flourishing for your company. Productivity and profitability go up, including, excuse me, wow, in a Kinsey study recently, gender diverse companies increase their profitability by 21% when they set out to be more gender inclusive at the top. They open up their C-suites to women and their, their, their profitability went up 21%. So look, if you're like, hey, I'm just a bottom line person, I just wanna be successful, may I suggest partnering with men and women in all that you do. Now, there is a small caveat. These same places have studied in cultures in the world where there is not the belief that man and woman are ontologically equal, places like Afghanistan, places where, I would say a retrograde view, but places where it do, the culture does not even pretend that women are just as important as men. Like we live in lots of culture, we say women are just as important as men, but we don't actually live like it. But in cultures where they're like, no, that's not true, this doesn't work. And so that's what they see is it, it like you can't force a culture to change just by putting men and women in the same room. But in Western cultures, especially in American companies, this works because it turns out we need each other. We supply what we're lacking. The example I give all the time is I spend every Tuesday morning with Martin and obviously he's a man and I'm a woman and it is amazing to me how much I learn from him and vice versa because there are experiences that I have as a single woman that he doesn't have and their experiences of course he has as a married man and a grandfather and a father that I don't have. And the two of us together believe that we are better when we partner and dialogue with each other about the needs of St. Jude because we bring a different and unique perspective to that. All right, so if that's what happened, what we don't see anything close to that in the world, right? You're like, cool, nice ideal. That is not at all what the world is like. And you're right, we've got this creation ideal. And you can imagine, right, for the Israelites, again, they're receiving this, this revelation from God. And Moses is like, hey, here's who God is. He's not, he, there's one God. There's one God in heaven and earth, not polytheistic Egyptian worship. And he didn't make y'all because he needed slaves. He didn't make you because he was lacking. He made you out of an abundance of love. And you guys, the creation just crescendos up. And here we are, man and woman at the top, the crowning jewel of creation. And people are going to rightly ask, we were just enslaved for 400 years. Like, are you crazy? That you can say that's what it is, but that's not what we're experiencing. And that's exactly right, because the next chapter is gonna go on. He goes, yeah, you're right. That's not what you have, and you wanna know why? Because all of a sudden, Genesis 3 comes after Genesis 1 and 2. And we get a fourth character that comes slithering in out of nowhere. And remember, Ish and Isha are meant to have dominion and rulership over the created world and suddenly we have part of the created world coming in and he's like, hey, you should eat that apple right there. We know it's not an apple, it's fruit tree, we don't know what it is, probably not an apple, who knows. But this is where I actually believe hierarchy gets birthed. Because I'm sitting here and I'm telling you, hey, here's the ideal, Genesis 1 and 2, here's the ideal. And you're like, that's not what's in the world. 
But that's because of Genesis 3. And when Genesis 3 happens, everything breaks. Everything breaks. Our minds broke. Our bodies broke. Our relationships broke. Our cosmos broke. Like, everything broke, including the relationships that God created. Remember the Adam, ah, gives the Adam, right? There's this, there's this supposed to be this synergy, like out of the ground we come, but then we cultivate the ground, and the ground gives us food, and then we give the ground nutrients, and there's supposed to be this system here. That gets broken. What does God tell Adam? You're going to toil over this Adam, ah. Adam, and then he looks at Ish and Ishan, and he goes, you guys were meant to be indispensable companions, and now what was this is this, and it gets broken, and it gets shattered, and everything breaks from that. So Beth Allison Barr right here, she wrote a book called uh, The Making of Biblical Womanhood, and it is, it's making its rounds. I think it's a fantastic book. I'd encourage everybody to read it. But part of her story was she was in predominantly conservative complementarian churches, so most churches, <laughs> that's what most of them are. Uh, and in those churches, or I would say like most evangelical slash PCA slash Southern Baptist, slash, like um, there are plenty of denominations that aren't complementary in the States, but Roman Catholic, Orthodox, sort of all that mainline, of course, but is in a different direction. And St. Jude's one of the weirdos in a different direction. But what she began realizing is she's a scholar, okay? She's a, she's a medieval church scholar. So for her, she's got the data to realize, hey, this idea of patriarchy is not really a biblical ideal. It's something that happened at the fall. So in her book, she, she writes about how she comes to this realization. So she quotes both Alice Matthews here, um, who is a theologian at Gordon-Conwell, and then on the next slide, she's going to quote uh, Stanley Gundry. And what both Alice Matthew and Stanley Gundry are saying is that patriarchy is not God's ideal. Like this men ruling over women is not the ideal. It's what happened at Genesis 3. This was Genesis 1 and 2. This was Genesis 3. So when people say, hey, here's how we should run our families, what Beth Allison Barr is arguing and using scholars like Alice Matthews and Stanley Gundry, and again, he's a conservative. He's part of the evangelical theological side. He's a conservative-ish. I mean, like, that's a broad tent, I realize. But He's not, he's not, um, like he's a, he's a Christian, like he's a normal, I don't know what I'm saying. He's a normal Christian guy who recognizes that Genesis 3 did this. So there are many scholars who go, no, 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 this is God's design. And there are lots of scholars, myself included, and Beth Allison Barr and others who go, no, 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 this is what we had. This is what the fall created. This is what the fall created between the Adama and the Adam. Like there is, man, the, this happened. And the same with Ish and Isha. And so he sums it up well. A patriarchy is created by people, not ordained by God. And that's what happens in Genesis 3. That there becomes suddenly enmity between the genders. What was supposed to be indispensable companions, suddenly we get patriarchy. Now, I feel like I should push pause real quick and, and define patriarchy. So... Patriarchy is one of those words, it's a buzzword right now that can mean a lot of different things, right? Um, I thought about wearing like down with the patriarchy shirt for y'all. I'm just kidding, I don't have one. Uh, but when I'm using the term patriarchy, what I mean by this and what these scholars are meaning is this idea that there is a father, a human father that rules over a house. So patriarchy, patri the father, the potter, familias, and then archi is to rule. And so there's a father that rules over his home, okay? And in the ancient world, you're talking about you, your wife, your children, their spouses, they, then also your concubines or your slaves and their spouses and maybe widows and maybe extended family. Like you're talking about a big unit here. And what I am arguing is that in the creation ideal, you have man and woman partnering together. And at the very end of chapter two, it says, this is the reason why a husband leave his father and his mother and join together in one flesh, conjugal one flesh, and that one fleshness means that they are now this and they're going to leave their father and mother and become a unit. In the ancient world, part of the problem with patriarchy is not just that now there's no, there's no complementarity between husband and wife, but for his sons, the inheritance and his father's will becomes more important. So you've got, you know, let's call him Bubba at the top, and his son, Tristan, I don't know where I got these names, and Tristan marries a gal, Jill. Well, what Genesis 2 would say is Jill and Tristan being together in one flesh, this is their highest calling to love each other. This is where, his, this is where Tristan's loyalty should rely. But Bubba gets his loyalty. 
because patriarchy means everything runs through the father. Now, if you've got a benevolent patriarch, great. But what if you don't? And maybe that's not God's best, and maybe there's a better way. So, if Genesis 3 is the creation of patriarchy, then it begs the question, well, isn't that just the world we live in? Like, why, why would we push back against that? That's just what it is, right? We can say we don't like what happened after Genesis 3, but that's where we're at. Well, this is why the gospel is such good news. This is why there's so much hope and beauty in the world. So what we have in our Christian theology is what we call garden to garden to garden theology. So this is the first garden, Eden. There's a second garden. And we just taught through it in the book of John where Jesus comes out of the tomb and Mary's like, where is the body? And guess who she mistakes Jesus for? The gardener. And that's John's way of going, ah, ah, we're in the second garden, people. And so we've got a second garden where the Adam, uh, the Adama, the ground, spits out because he jumps out our second Adam, our second Adam. Our second Adam comes out, and the Adama couldn't hold him down any longer, right? Everybody else returns to the Adama. Everybody else dies. Everybody else gets dust over them. The dust rules over everyone else. Every other Adam dies, and the dust is hanging on them. And our, ne our new Adam was like, the dust comes off, and he and, and Mary are in the second garden, and then we're going to a future garden, which we'll talk about in a second. But the question becomes, what happened on Easter? What did we get back? Now, the reality is, is we got back everything, okay? That, the, the, the resurrection changes everything. Easter is the game changer for us in Christianity. That is just true, okay? But all that broke on Genesis 3 and all that we get back on Easter is there's a reality that it's already true, but we've got more to go, okay? So all of us are still going to die unless the Lord tarries, right? And so you're like, well, you're going to die. And I'm like, yes, but it's not forever. There's a resurrection coming and all of us go well, we are sinners and transgressors because of genesis 3 and i go yeah, yeah yeah but now you are truly saved and truly forgiven in christ so we're getting back eden as we head to our final eden and we don't always experience in the fullness now but it's what is reality and we should live like reality we should live like Jesus knocked down the dividing wall of hostility, that there is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male nor female. We should live in that reality now because that's what Jesus accomplishes. Now, are we going to feel it all right now? No, but it's who we're meant to be. So Martin says it like this. He says, here's what we had in Genesis 1 and 2, okay? Male and female, Ish and Isha. And then this happens in Genesis 3. Now we've got male ruling over female. This is not good. And he'd say, this is what happens at Easter, is this comes back. We get back to here. And this is who we should be. Now, does it exist like this? No, oftentimes like this. And frankly, sometimes it's like this. But that's where we should be. We should strive to be these people, where men and women recognize that we are indispensable companions. And all that we have now and don't already have yet is where we're going, though. We are going to another garden. And we are supposed to live like that. And so that garden, I thought about this like a couple months ago, somebody asked the question, hey ladies, hey ladies, um, if tomorrow, poof, Thanos snaps, all the men are gone for 24 hours. Like, it's not like tragic, like we're not gonna all be grieving, we're just like, we took them out of the earth, okay? So it's not like, what would you do? Like I would cry and cry and never stop crying if men disappeared. But like, the point being like, if you just knew that you had 24 hours without men on earth, women, what would you do? And I don't know what they thought the answers would be. But overwhelmingly, I don't know if you can read this, but it says things like go on walks at night. Go out wearing whatever I want and not be worried about being attacked. I would, I would go for a jog at night. And overwhelmingly, this is what women wrote. And it's a reality. Like It was a wake-up moment for so many people. And I and tell this to men all the time. They go, wait, do you all fear that? And I'm telling you, I'm like, do you all know how many women at night put their keys between their hands because they're scared? And that is the enmity between man and woman, that rather than viewing each other as indispensable companions, we have a war in between the genders. But the thing about the final garden is all that goes away, right? So if you think about what is said in Revelation 21 through 22, 5, it says, And I saw a temple in the city, because the Lord God, the all-powerful, and the land the Lamb, excuse me, are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, because the glory of God lights it up 
and its lamp is the lamb. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their grandeur into it. Its gates will never be closed during the day, and there will be no night there. The gates are never closed because you're safe. You're safe. You don't have to lock your door at night where we're going. They will bring the grandeur and the wealth of the nations into it, but nothing ritually unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or practices falsehood, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, water as clear as crystal, can't wait to swim in that, pouring out from the throne of God and of the Lamb, flowing down in the middle of the city's main street. On each side of the river is the tree of life, producing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month of the year. Can't wait to eat that. And you don't have to just wait for one season to have delicata squash, so let's go heaven. Its leaves are for the healing of the nations. And there will no longer be any curse. Genesis 3. There's a curse because of what happened at that tree between Adam and Eve. And Adam's curse is the Adama is rebelling and the Ish and the Isha's curses. There's enmity between them. And that's gone. All that enmity is gone. And the throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city. His servants will worship him and they will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. Night will be no more. No more night. And they will not need the light of the lamp or the light of sun because the Lord God will shine on them and they will reign forever and ever. We were always meant to rule and reign. That's what Genesis 1 and 2 tells us. Rule and reign in a garden meant for your flourishing. And we lost it. But we're going back. We're going back, and we're not going back into a world where we have to fear this any longer. When you get to this world, the only pitter-patter of feet behind you are not because someone means harm for you, but it's because someone can't wait to walk with you into the cool of night, down by the crystal clear river, and maybe pick some apricots that are in season all year. That's where we're going. And we believe at St. Jude, where we're going should determine how we live now. And the reality is we are far from that. The genders are at war with each other, and the church should be a refuge against that. These statistics you can find any day. They, there's RAINN is a website that keeps track of these statistics. One out of six women have been the victim of attempted or completed rape. And if this is your story, I, I, am, I am deeply sorry. And if you need help or support, please let Martin and I know. But these are statistics that are true. And not only that, it's happening to young boys as well. Like the war between the genders, like the hierarchy, the reality is, is it's not just men hurting women and women hurting men, but it's humans hurting humans because we don't think of each other as indispensable companions. We don't think, I need you and you need me. Every 68 seconds an American is sexually assaulted. The greatest risk are young people, Native Americans, and prisoners. People who are already locked up are being harmed in this way. And it's unconscionable that the church would look the other way. The church is meant to be a refuge against the enmity between men and women. It's supposed to be a place of safety and security. And how many more stories do we have to hear about of where this is the exact opposite of what's happening? We are to be now who we will be. We are meant to live like Genesis 1 and 2 and Revelation 21 and 22 people. And it's not reality. We're going to fall short. It's not going to be perfect. But that's who we are. That's what Jesus went and got back for us. He undid the curse for us so that this doesn't have to happen. But this and this can happen. So what's our big so what? I don't want y'all to miss out on the fact that this is what God told to a patriarchal society, that men and women are made in his image. So these people are coming out of Egypt, they're in the ancient Near East, they're in a world where women and children and slaves are just devalued. And those are the very people that God's like, oh, no, 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 you want to know what women are like? They're Azers. I'm like, Azers, isn't that what you call yourself when you rescue it and save us from danger? And he's like, yeah, <laughs> that's exactly what I just said. Women are meant to be viewed as indispensable companions. And this is a culture that would have been like, that's strange for us. More strange than many of us here in America. Like, I know many of you grew up in churches where you thought that this is the ideal. And maybe you're still going to hold on for that a little bit. I'm going to rub, I'm going to push, I'm going to try and convince you. But even still, now you're talking about a culture that had this. And God's going, hey, this, 
this is what I want for you all. Of course, the next so what is we need to partner together. Men need women and women need men and we should celebrate this. It's a beautiful thing that we need each other. And I know we don't like being needy. I know we don't like being vulnerable. I know we want to think about this, but Carolyn Custis James rightly says that a solitary image bearer cannot adequately or accurately reveal God in the world, much less fulfill his destiny as a human being. Obviously, this is a matter of grave importance to the creator. How can you image a God who is love without someone to love? Unless you just want to love yourself, but we have a word for that. It's called narcissism. And we need each other to encourage, to love, to experience joy together, to sing together, to work together, to pray together, to be the people of God. We need to do a better job, too, of creating spaces where men and women can thrive. It's part of the reason why most of what we do at St. Jude is COVID. One, because of the size of we are, it doesn't make sense to segregate us out yet into these genders. But And that's not to say, like, every time you do that is wrong. I mean, we think that's healthy, too. There are times when you need, like, guys to have guy time and gals to have gal time. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is, is it's so rare in the church that you can come together and do theology together and learn from each other and gain from each other. And we believe we are at our best. We have mixed gender company, multi-ethnic company, multi-socioeconomic, multi-background, multi-life experiences because we learn and grow from those experiences and they're uncomfortable. It's easier to just have a women's group. It's easier to just have a men's group. We know it's uncomfortable men and women get together. We say stupid things. We make jokes the other people don't think it's funny. We, we don't understand. We assume things and grow like it's messy and it's hard and it's beautiful and it's good, and it's what makes us more conformed into the image and likeness of the God who created us. All right, friends, if nobody's told you today that they love you, I do, but way more importantly, God does. This was week one. Love you, grace, and peace. And uh, next week, we'll be talking about Deborah and the Proverbs 31 woman. See you, friends.